I tried to imagine a fellow smarter than myself, and then I tried to think, what would he do? Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, neurotropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. I'm your host, Jesse Lawler, excited to bring you the latest and the greatest in the battle for the betterment of your own brain on this podcast dedicated to all that stuff. This is going to be an unusual episode. We're going to be doing it a little differently. This is a self-experiment episode, which we haven't done for a while. But I finally cracked open the box on the TDCS, that's Transcranial Direct Current Stimulation System, that I bought a while ago and has been waiting for just such a proper occasion. Charged the thing up, put it on my forehead, and gave it a rip. And so this is going to be a little two-part episode. First, we're going to have my kind of personal subjective take on the experience, which I recorded on the day that I first did it. And then I've got an interview with a guy named Christopher Zobrist, who is definitely a personal optimization geek of the highest order. He's been a big TDCS fan, proponent, practitioner for about a year now, and has been looking into it quite aggressively, and is certainly further along the TDCS road than I am myself. So we have a conversation about what he's picked up along the way too. So you're going to hear two takes on TDCS usage from TDCS users. If you hang around until the end of the episode, as mentioned last week, I'm going to tell you a disgusting way that you might be able to earn a little bit of side cash from something that I'm sure you do anyway. But before we get into any of that, let's do This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts, This Week in Neuroscience. So unless you're a masochist, chances are you just don't like pain. Most of us don't. And scientists in Germany are breaking new ground on a new approach to pain management based on a genetic anomaly that's very rare, occasionally turns up, and allows some people to not feel pain at all. This is is generally not a genetic anomaly that actually you would want to have. It's nice as it sounds, the kids that have this gene mutation, you know, kids being kids, they just wind up getting the ever-loving crap beat out of them by themselves because nothing hurts so they'll you know, punch themselves in the face and think nothing of it and like look like prize fighters with you know bloody noses and black eyes constantly and stuff like that but nothing hurts and so it's interesting because it doesn't stop the sense of touch it really just stops the sense of pain associated with it this particular genetic mutation and a german team has isolated that mutation to the gene scn11a the gene influences nerve impulses that are sent to the brain by the body that triggers a pain response and they've recently been working with knock in mice knock out mice you might know are mice with a certain part of their genes knocked out of their normal genome for study knock in mice is the opposite when a gene is implanted in the mice and they've been working with with knock in mice with this introduced mutant SCN11A gene to see if, yep, this is the one that does block the feeling of pain. And the answer seems to be yes. So now scientists are getting down to work to try to find out ways to apply this science and replicate the effects of this mutant SCN11A gene with a pharmaceutical or something similar. Now, maybe you didn't know that this week is a big holiday week between the 16th and the 22nd of March 2015, but it is. What holiday are you thinking? Could it possibly be? It's International Brain Awareness Week. You might not have had Brain Awareness Week on your calendar, and if so, we can forgive you. But it is going on right now. There's a website for it. It's www.dana.org slash B-A-W for Brain Awareness Week, where you'll find things like a calendar, tips and resources, a photo gallery, and all sorts of recommendations for things that you can do to throw a brain party, educate your friends, neighbors, relatives about brains, and all that stuff. Brain Awareness Week is basically a global campaign to increase public awareness about the progress and the benefits that can be derived from brain research. So as a proud brain owner, you're already part of the club, so check it out. Also, got an email that I, I wanted to share. This is a little bit of a correction by a listener who's listening very astutely a couple of episodes ago. I'd mentioned that I'm going to be doing a ketogenic diet for a while following the water fast that I did, which is true. I have been eating a ridiculously high fat diet, although, and this is a longer story, apparently not even high fat enough because I still seem to be in what's called gluconeogenesis where your body breaks down proteins and turns them into carbohydrates. But listener Charles Hunt sent me a quick message about gaining my water weight back after the fast and that I said I would expect to gain my weight back pretty quickly. And he pointed out, well, if you're going to be on a ketogenic diet, that's not necessarily true because because you won't be rebuilding your glycogen stores and you won't be rebuilding the water that holds that glycogen in suspension, which is most of the weight that was lost. And that's actually true. I'm still down almost 11 pounds from my pre-fasting weight. So despite the fact it's been over three weeks now since I've been eating again, the weight has not come right back on. Although I suspect if I were back to my normal diet of lots of fruit and stuff, it probably would have been coming back much, much faster. But thank you for that correction, Charles. 
Smart Drug Smarts. It's okay. We're going to veer from the normal Smart Drug Smarts format a little bit with this episode and kick things off with sort of a high-speed journey through my own virgin run on TDCS as I gave it a go about a week and a half ago. So cue the Wayback Machine. Try to relax. This will feel a little weird. Okay, so something a little different this time. I've got myself a brand new Focus Gamer TDCS system, which uh, I'm just going to unzip now, read the instructions, put this thing on, strap myself in, and we'll see what happens. All right, so got this little package. It's like the size of a giant headphone package or something like that. Inside, we've got a manual, a USB cable, uh, some silica gel, eight little sponges, and then the device itself... Let me read the instructions here, and then I'll continue. What you need to understand before using Focus says, Focus is designed to improve your mental gaming skills by exciting and inhibiting sections of your prefrontal cortex within an electric current. Possible side effects include visual artifacts such as white flashes, nausea, headaches, and fatigue. And that if I experience any of these side effects, I should stop my focus session. If I see white flashes, which are known as phosphenes, I should adjust the position of the Focus headset away from my eyes. Now, I may feel a tingling, hot or cold sensation, and if these sensations become uncomfortable or painful, I should stop my session. If I exceed the recommended session duration, I increase the risk of consolidating both excitatory and inhibitory processes. And finally, focus should not be used during any activities other than sedentary gaming. Now, I'm going to laugh in the face of that one because I'm not a gamer. I'm not really going to do that. I'm going to do some other stuff that will be mentally strenuous for me and see how I hold up. Little reading, a little writing, and a little computer programming is what I've got planned for the next couple of hours. Okay, so I'm now about six minutes into my first TDCS session. I've got this thing on my forehead. It took a little bit of adjustment, I think, to get it into the right place. But given the shape of my skull and the, uh, the shape of this thing, I've done the best that I can. It definitely hurts a little bit. Not anything that is beyond what they expect, but kind of feels like a continuous pinprick in at least the lower of the two spots where the point of connection is being made. Also worth noting, as I look at this user's manual, there's apparently different modes that this thing can do. It can send the amperage into you as a sine wave or a constant current or a pulsed current with offset and finally a random noise current. I'm doing the default, which is just a constant current. It kind of builds up to a current plateau, sticks around there and then turns off when you turn it off. I'm doing the generic middle of the road settings of medium 1.2 milliamps and a constant current, which is sort of the default settings for the device on this Virgin Run. So the first and most probably noticeable effect to an outside observer is that I've still got four distinct red marks on my forehead where the electricity was going into and out of my brain. Those are expected to clear up, but it's definitely, uh, I I look a little bit funny right now. You would notice it looking at me. As far as sort of the subjective effects following the TDCS session, it was nice to uh, get the thing off. The little pinpricks of pain instantly went away and I can't feel anything now other than just sort of a general feeling of, of invigoration, I guess. I feel motivated and peppy and alert, maybe similar similar to a good night's sleep plus some strong caffeine or something like that. I did get a good night's sleep. I haven't had any caffeine or anything like that yet today that would mask or alter the effects of the TDCS. I didn't want to come into this biased. I am going to eat a little breakfast. I haven't heard any counterindications from food and TDCS, so we'll see how that goes down, and we'll report back soon. So now it's almost an hour and a half after the TDCS session. I still have the red marks on my forehead. They don't seem to be noticeably diminished, but I'm sure over the course of the next couple hours, they'll probably fade out. But for the conspicuously fashion conscious among you, you might want to be aware of that little oddball leftover of having done a TDCS session or at least have some skin colored makeup that you can lay down as foundation or something. But yeah, about 90 minutes later, still feel alert, invigorated, peppy. And while I can't say it's a life changing experience, it's definitely one that seems to be doing something. I, I do feel va 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 boom. So I wanted to do something during this first TDCS experiment that wouldn't be purely subjective, and I was trying to think of what I could kind of do to measure my cognition or at least measure my um, rapidity of information processing in a quantifiable way. So I fell back on that old standby of typing speed, and I went to a little online typing test. I'm not the fastest typist in the world, but I'm not the slowest typist. I actually feel like I didn't do particularly well on either of these because I'm not used to typing fast when I'm reading something and then having to type it down. I do pretty fast typing when I'm just writing what I'm thinking, but anyway. So I did a typing test probably about 
two hours into my TDCS session. And then I just did a typing test earlier today. Today is a non-nootropic day for me. I haven't, I got, I don't even think I've had any caffeine yet today, which is unusual. So somewhat interestingly, although take all this with a grain of salt, my two minute typing test while under the influence of TDCS, I was 57 words per minute, but with two misspelled words. Whereas today with no caffeine, no TDCS, no anything, I was at only 49 words per minute, but with zero misspelled words. So I was a little bit slower and surer footed today, whereas I was burning rubber, but uh, made a couple of typing goofs while under the influence of TDCS. So take that for what you will. And now, if I may, I'd like to introduce Christopher Zobris. Chris is somebody that I, I met at first, gosh, I guess about two years ago. And we've, we've got a bunch of mutual friends, and I knew that he was into nootropics and TDCS, but we hadn't really ever gotten together and connected about this stuff. But when I finally strapped on my TDCS headset and decided it was about time to make an episode about this, he was definitely on my short list of people to call as an actual regular user practitioner. So let's hear what he has to say. He has a much deeper perspective on this stuff than I do it in my early point along the TDCS journey. I first heard about transcranial magnetic stimulation through a book I was reading called The The Brain That Changed Itself. And it was a really good book. I introduced the TMS, which is uh, similar to TDCS, but using electromagnetic coils. TDCS, I started reading about it through articles that cited both TMS and TDCS. So that was kind of my entryway into TDCS. And since you've gotten started, how many of these devices have you tangled with personally now? Uh, Yeah, I've tried about four or five devices uh, that are available on the market. The first device I got a hold of was the Focus uh, device, and that was the version one uh, that came out a few years ago. When I got it, they had just launched their iPhone app, which helped to allow users to customize the the type of uh, stimulation, the duration, and the amplitude, which was a big you know, variable in, in the actual stimulation protocol. So for a first device, that was a good introduction for me. And then I moved on to the TCT transcranial kit after that, and I've been using that mostly since then. The different patterns they have are continuous. There's also a pulse, which delivers fixed pulse current, like sharp pulses. And then there's the noise, which is random. And then they actually have a, a sham stimulation, which will ramp up the current at a normal level, but then slowly ramp down so you don't really notice whether the current's on or not. So they they did some interesting stuff with the uh, first version. They just came out with a version 2, which has a lot of the same functionality, but a, a bit different form factor. Now, as far as those different variations in the delivery of current, when you tried it, I mean, did you notice any real subjective differences afterwards? Oh, yeah, absolutely. When I was first using the Focus and I was trying... Uh, I just tried the continuous uh, waveform for the first couple weeks uh, just because that followed the protocols that were found in the published studies. I was curious about the other one, so I just tried it more just out of curiosity. And uh, when you set it to either pulse or or the sine wave, which actually delivers uh, pulses in between waves, I noticed uh, phosphenes, what are called phosphenes, which is actually the current stimulating the optic nerve enough to create a, a flash of light in your visual field. And so that was my first kind of experience with actually seeing the effects of the stimulation. It was kind of scary at first, but I learned later that it was not uh, dangerous at all. So you've been doing TDCS for a while now, but you also do a bunch of other cognitive interventions as well. You do nootropics, you exercise regularly, you do meditation. What's your determination factor for when TDCS is the thing for that day or that hour or whatever? When do you pull the TDCS device out of the drawer? I was using TDCS every day, actually, for the first six months. And I was using it because I actually started to notice improvements in my vision. And I have a congenital condition called optic atrophy. And so I've uh, been actually legally blind since birth. And uh, so it's always been hard for me to see things from far away. And when I started using TDCS, I actually noticed that I could see things, notice things in my visual field farther away than I could before, especially at night. That's what kind of led me to start using it every day is if it was improving my vision, I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll you know, do it more and see how, much, how far I can go. So I had been using it every day for six months and kind of also measuring my vision with various tools, uh, apps, and, and just seeing things from distance. After about six months, I think I kind of topped out in terms of what I could gain from, from improvements. And so I started tapering down my usage. And so now I'm down to about once a week uh, I use it. And I don't feel like I need to use it, but it's just something that helps me to either concentrate better. Sometimes I'll use it before going to a workout 
where I want to get a, uh, you know, a bit more strength training or endurance training. And uh, sometimes I use it to help go to sleep, actually. There's, there's protocols that will help to uh, aid in sleep or pain reduction. So those are my things that I, I kind of use it for, and, and usually just once a week. Now, a fun fact for the listeners who cannot see you, you are completely shaved bald, so you've got the perfect haircut for TDCS, and you've tried putting the electrodes on different parts of your scalp. Can you talk about your experiences there? Yeah, yeah. I think I started shaving my head actually before I started using TDCS, but then after starting to use it, it became very evident that it was a, a benefit to not have the hassle of hair. My girlfriend also uses my TDCS device, and I started working with her to uh, use it for her motion sickness. She gets really car sick, and so it was a problem for us, especially when going on long trips. Uh, she'd have to take you know medication to basically knock herself out when you're on vacation. It's not a not a great thing. So uh, she's been using it to, uh, you know, when we, before we go on a car trip and it's amazing because, you know, before she started using it to today, she's perfectly comfortable in the car. She can text and do all kinds of stuff. Uh, whereas before she would just be totally out of commission. But the hair thing is, is definitely makes it more challenging for her to use it than for me. Can you tell us about the specific areas on your scalp that you've stimulated to get different types of effects? People who use TDCS researchers as well as DIY community uh, go by the 1020 EEG system. So uh, the, the positions on the scalp are demarcated by the different lobes of the brain. So in the front, you have the frontal cortex. It's either FZ or FPZ. So basically on the forehead or slightly above the hairline. So stimulating the areas on either the left or right are the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, as you're probably familiar with. So DLPFC. Uh, areas. If you stimulate uh, one or both of those, it, it improves energy and focus and attention. If you stimulate the uh, motor cortex or premotor cortex, so that's in the parietal lobe, kind of at the crown of the skull, those areas are best if you want to stimulate either pain reduction or uh, sports performance. And then my favorite area is the what's known as the right temporal parietal junction, which is kind of up and behind about maybe two inches behind the right ear. And that place actually is known as the center for empathy. So being able to put yourself in someone else's situation, view the world from other people's perspectives, that area of the brain lights up. And so I found that, especially with certain types of meditation, loving kindness meditation in particular, uh, stimulating that part of the brain really makes the meditation more effective. Let's talk a little about what people think might be the mechanisms of action actually taking place within the brain as a result of TDCS and why people are seeing effects. Yeah, yeah, sure. One of the theories that's out there is that because TDCS is basically up-regulating or down-regulating the populations of neurons under the areas of stimulation. That's one of the main effects. And then the other effect is that the current is actually passing in between the two electrodes. So if you have both electrodes placed on the scalp, then the current is going through the channels, or you can think of your brain as a bunch of internet cables, ethernet wires, all tangled and connected. It's sending current through from one electrode to another, and it's essentially occupying those lines of communication. So when you try and do a task during the same time as you're stimulating, it's like those lines are uh, busy and your brain has to adapt and adjust and forge new routes to send the signals in between those two regions. And uh, that adaptation mechanism may actually in the long term create more capacity between those specific regions and in those networks. So that's one kind of theory that, that is out there and, and still needs to be proven through research, but, but it makes sense. So you'd kind of be building additional bandwidth within the brain because while the TDCS is going on, you'd be occupying the bandwidth that you'd normally have available and using for those processes. Yeah, exactly. You know, in the brain, it's all about signal to noise. And uh, your brain is really communicating through focus signals of many neurons building up, going up and down the, uh, the cortical stacks that are in the neocortex. So that's one uh, theory of, of how it's uh, operating. And is that squared up with your experience that you're really only noticing these subjective effects in the time after your session? During the couple times I've done it now, that's, I felt totally normal while I've done it. But 
the sort of the kick, the uptick has come afterwards? Mm -hmm. It really depends not only on what regions of the brain you're stimulating, but also what you're doing either during or after the stimulation. So they've shown this in the research studies too, is that if you, there, there is a big difference in the effects, whether you're just sitting doing nothing or you're actively doing some type of uh, mental activity, you know, cognitive activity during the stimulation. And then that will also affect kind of how your brain adapts and adjusts to the period after the stimulation. Usually it's about 12 to 24 hours that the stimulation will kind of up or down regulate the regions that you stimulated. So that would kind of be the best practices version of how to approach TDCS then is to do during the TDCS session while you're actually getting the current applied, whatever it is that you want to be you know, getting better at, getting more proficiency at later. Yeah, exactly. How has TDCS interacted with your meditation sessions? Yeah, I started experimenting with it with meditation just because I was curious. There's you know no published studies or protocols about it. There's a lot of studies about meditation and its effects. And then there's these other studies about TDCS, but no one has yet put those two things together. So I think you know for the researchers in the audience, that may be a, an area of, of uh, interest. But for me, from what I understood about meditation research, it seemed like when they put them into an fMRI machine and get a, a picture of what was going on inside the brain of the meditator while they were in a meditative state. And so it seemed like the medial frontal cortex, uh, prefrontal cortex, seemed to be quieter during meditation and, and the parietal lobe tended to light up. So when I was preparing to do a meditation session, uh, I put the cathode on the medial frontal, prefrontal cortex and the anode on the parietal cortex, or the parietal lobe rather, and you know ran the current just to see how I felt afterwards and also during my meditation session. And after that first try, I felt like it was much easier to get into that groove uh, in meditation where you, you really you know, have a free and open kind of mind. And so I also experimented with actually doing the stimulation, that same protocol, while meditating. And I felt the effects even stronger then. And there are, haven't been many published studies about what happens long term of stimulating the brain in that way. And so I wanted to kind of limit it. So, so right now I, I still use that protocol maybe once every week or once every other week uh, before meditation. But I do meditate uh, almost every day. What have you found as far as the difference in the amperage settings on the TDCS devices? I, I don't remember exactly how low it goes, but I think that the top end is about two milliamps that actually gets applied. Yeah, in most published studies, I think the minimum they use for most of the protocols is one milliamp. Below that is uh, you, you probably not enough to produce any long-term effects from the stimulation. But between one and two milliamps is usually the protocol uh, used. Uh, I've mostly used just two milliamps just because uh, I felt like one probably wasn't enough to really make a difference for me. But for everyone is different. And also, it really depends on the size of sponges that you're using. I tend to use larger sponges, three by four inches, whereas the Focus version one came with very small sponges, two circular sponges that were about a, a, an inch in diameter. And so, uh, you know, the current density is the thing that affects most when considering sponge size. And so you're basically concentrating all of that current into a much smaller space with a smaller sponge. When I use larger sponges, even though I'm doing it two milliamps, it's spreading the current out much more. And, you know, it's going through more channels, essentially. So with any sort of electrical circuit system like TDCS, we're uh, applying current somewhere and taking the current out somewhere else. So we've got a circuit. Now, why is it that it seems like people are always both applying and removing current through the scalp? Couldn't we equally well, like, potentiate part of the brain by applying positive current going in through the scalp, but then suck the current out through my elbow or something like that so I'm not overtly depotentiating one area of my brain? Well, and that does actually, and I, sh I should have uh, maybe clarified that too, is that you can have one electrode off the scalp, and that's usually called an extracephalic montage. And usually you, you want to put the anode on the scalp and then the cathode on, off the scalp, and then you're just getting the positive stimulation to the brain as opposed to having the, the plus and minus. Um, so I do usually use extracephalic or, or off the scalp montages like that, just because exactly what you said, you don't want to necessarily be down regulating certain parts of your brain. And a lot of uh, studies actually use those protocols too, and, and with good effect. So in addition to TDCS and TMS, you are also a nootropics user, a meditator, an exerciser. So you sort of got the full experimentalist gamut of things that you like to do to play with your brain. Can you tell us about how some of these things interact with one another in, in your experience? Yeah, sure. I've always been into self-improvement. And so 
I started kind of on this direction, getting back into regular exercise. I think regular exercise was the first thing that I hadn't done in a while. And uh, I had a friend uh, who really wanted to go to the gym. So, so getting into that routine of daily exercise, I think, is a really solid base for launching into this direction. So I don't know what it would be like, actually, because I go to the gym every day now. I'm not sure what the effects would be with TDCS if I didn't exercise regularly and have that regular blood flow. And, and I also use the sauna. So hyperthermia is actually something that has now been shown to increase levels of BDNF, uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is an essential cofactor for TDCS to actually work. And that, this came out of research from, uh, I think, the Netherlands, where they actually took mice, knockout mice, who had no ability to produce BDNF, or they were impaired in, in some way, and they found that TDCS just had no effect on them. So BDNF levels are, are definitely something that are, are worth figuring out if you're going to think about incorporating TDCS into a regular practice. I also started meditating about uh, six months after that, and, and I learned to meditate when I was young, also through uh, kind of sports performance envisioning uh, exercises when I was in high school. And so I found it very easy to get back into it. When I first started meditating, uh, this was before starting TDCS. And so my meditation sessions I felt were good, and uh, they were helping me out. But it still took a lot of energy and, and concentration to really get into that groove. I think TDCS really made a difference there in that it, uh, again, allowed me to get into that groove faster and just have a much more productive sessions in terms of my meditation. And I've always limited my meditation sessions to about 20 minutes because I, I figure that's about as much time as I can dedicate for that right now. But you know, TDCS really helps me get the most out of that. In between those, I had started taking different nutritional supplements, kind of starting just with fish oil. And then as I started learning more about the brain and especially about the mechanisms of action for TDCS, and, and especially I have had issues with uh, monosodium glutamate, MSG. Before starting to learn about the brain, I didn't even know glutamate was a neurotransmitter. I mean, it's actually the, the number one excitatory neurotransmitter. And I never under got the connection why... Uh, after I ate a bowl of uh, the Vietnamese soup, pho, it had a ton of MSG I knew, and it would always give me headaches. And so it was kind of reading up and, ma and making that connection between the glutamate that I was eating and the glutamate that would you know, get into my brain and, and cause the headaches through excitotoxicity. So I became much more aware of, of what I was eating and how it was affecting my daily routine. And so I started taking uh, supplements to help actually reduce the level of glutamate in my blood which would cause an afflux of glutamate from the brain. I would used to get headaches maybe two or three times a week, you know, really bad migraines, uh, where I couldn't get out of bed. I would, I'd feel nauseous, I'd be very sensitive to light. And uh, after taking these supplements, all of a sudden I, I had no, no more headaches. So, I mean, that was a huge thing. Um, so I became, you know, <laughs> almost a, a, a big believer in making sure that the neurotransmitter and neurochemical balance in the brain is is optimized for all of these other things. So within TDCS, you have sort of the this hardcore of do-it-yourselfers that are actually building their own devices versus buying the off-the-shelf stuff. What kind of distinguishes that group other than the fact that they're building their own things? Like what are they getting out of it that's extra? To me, it, it's almost like the early days of the PC. Before the Focus, really, I mean, there weren't really any ready-made devices available. So if I had learned about TDCS two or three years ago, I would have been hard pressed to find an off-the-shelf device that actually, you know, delivered the right amount of current and had the right sponges and had all the, you know, the right bells and whistles to to be a functional bare minimum kind of device. Now there's, you know, eight or ten devices available, and they all, you know, have varying degrees of features and and benefits, but they're all still based on that same, you know, model. It's it's batteries connected to some wires and have some controllers. I don't have a, a an electrical engineering background, so I had no hope of you know assembling my own. And I think most of the DIY community that puts together devices now has that more electrical engineering background and skills set. And what I've noticed from at least the TDCS subreddit is that the people who do put together their own devices are very knowledgeable about all of the current and all of how wires are connected to different things and how to make a functional unit. And they've even published you know, open source kind of schematics for how to do it. But they're much more interested in the hardware 
than in the actual applications of the hardware. So now the obligatory question of where do you see this technology, TDCS, TMS, the related technologies growing in the next couple of years? TDCS is by itself not a magic bullet. It's not the holy grail of of neuromodulation. I think we have a long way to go in terms of technologies that can influence our brain development after maturity. And what it comes down to is neuroplasticity. We're trying to increase neuroplasticity, which leads to increased ability to learn and and to think and to perform everyday cognitive activities. And I think that the focus right now is a lot on basic TDCS research uh, in the labs and some folks like me who are using that in kind of therapeutic or cognitive enhancement kind of applications. But TDCS is, is by no means the, the end of this uh, development. And I think what we'll see coming out in the next few years are devices that use either TDCS or TACS or other types of brain stimulation like LLT, which is a form of uh, low-level laser therapy is what it's called. And that also has an ability to affect cellular respiration. And it's been used kind of in limited applications for pain relief in, around the body, but it also can just as easily affect neurons in the brain and make them operate more efficiently. As the kind of quantified self movement is right now focused on the body, I think that'll slowly gravitate upwards because there's only so much you can improve in terms of your physical health. At the end of the day, all of our thoughts and and activities and actions and, and ability to perform in a physical sense are governed by what we have at the top of us, which is which is the brain. And I think as more and more people learn that and realize that, this whole field will will just burst open with opportunities for, for new hardware, software, and applications of those all towards the end of improving our brains. Smart Drug Smarts. So thank you very much to Christopher Zobrist for sharing his TDCS and TMS and other experiences with us. I'm definitely happy to have kind of another toy in the toy box for my own cognitive enhancement. I'm not 100% decided on how frequently I'll be TDCSing. I'm going to have to kind of figure that out as I go along. I'm not quite committed enough necessarily to shave my head so I can try all different parts of my scalp with equal effectiveness, but my curiosity is definitely peaked on it after having given it a few goes now. So I'll let you know as that keeps going. And now, as promised, the Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Smart Drug Smarts. Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. This doesn't have a whole lot to do with neuroscience, but it is kind of scientific and interesting and definitely weird, and I thought it might be something worth bringing to your attention. If you live in the Massachusetts area, there's a company called Open Biome, a nonprofit in Medford, Massachusetts, and they are looking for poop. In fact, they will pay people up to $13,000 per year for ongoing stool samples. That's right, human feces. The going rate is $40 per donation with a $50 kicker for those who come in and poop for them five days per week. That's a cool $250 a week, up to $13,000 per year for poop. Why would they do this? Well, there's actually a fairly common horrible infection with something called Clostridium difficile, which is a bacteria that is highly resistant to antibiotics. And in order to clear it out of people's systems, they need to, I guess, go on such severe antibiotics that it winds up completely cleaning out their gastrointestinal tract of the microbiome that's supposed to live in there and help people do digestion. So the patient's gut microbiota is pretty much wiped out and conventional probiotics are not sufficient to replace the good bacteria that are supposed to be there. And so the way of dealing with this is a fecal transplant. That's one person's poop, a donor poop, going up into the bowels of the poop recipient. And this is like a life-saving treatment. These are people that would die without a poop transplant, believe it or not. And so this company, Open Biome, makes frozen poop pellets that can be, I guess it's probably easier and less disgusting to deposit a frozen poop pellet than a room temperature one. But yeah, so these, uh, this company's buying poop and saving lives with it. A 50 gram slice of poop can save one person and uh, 450 grams can save up to nine people. So size matters when it comes to poop. Smart Drug Smarts. The podcast so smart, we have smart in our title. Twice. You heard it. That is the episode. If you liked what you heard, please recommend this podcast to your friends and or leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or another podcasty platform of your choice. The show notes for this episode will be online as usual at smartdrugsmarts.com. There's quite a few of them this week for all the things we talked about here. And I will be back at you next week or even sooner with my unflagging commitment to helping you fine tune the performance of your own brain. Have a great brain awareness week and stay smart. 
You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smarts should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.